If you really want to understand the rape and slaughter being committed in the name of Allah by the Islamic State, you have to study the history of Muhammad and his companions, a history found in the Hadith and the Sira literature. But you can get a pretty good outline of the Islamic State's message and tactics by reading the Quran, which Muslims believe to be the direct word of Allah. For those of you who don't have time to read the Quran, here's a top 10 list of the most essential verses for understanding ISIS. In the Bible, Jesus says that God loves everyone. In the Quran, not so much. Surah 3, verse 32. Say, obey Allah and the Apostle, but if they turn back, then surely Allah does not love the unbelievers. According to the Quran, Allah only loves obedient Muslims. I wonder why ISIS doesn't seem to have much love for non-Muslims. Believe it or not, Allah's complete lack of love for non-Muslims plays a role in how non-Muslims are to be treated. Surah 48, verse 29. Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, and those who are with him are severe against unbelievers and merciful among themselves. Those who are with Muhammad, i.e. Muslims, are severe against whom? Against unbelievers. They're merciful to whom? Only to their fellow Muslims. But politicians and the media just can't figure out why ISIS is so severe against non-Muslims. There are lots of ways to be severe against unbelievers. Here's one, Surah 4, verse 24. Also forbidden are women already married, except those captives and slaves whom your right hands possess. This may be confusing without the historical context, which you can read in Sunan Abu Dawud 2150. When Muhammad won the Battle of Altas, Allah had already revealed that Muslims were free to rape their female captives. But at Altas, the Muslim army captured certain women along with their husbands, and some of the Muslims started wondering if raping these women counted as adultery, because they were married. That's when Allah revealed Surah 4, verse 24, which says that married women are indeed forbidden as sex partners unless they're your captives. If they're your captives, rape them all you want. Allah couldn't conceivably care less that they're married. Heard about any groups raping their female captives recently? What about people who try to stop the Islamic State from establishing Sharia? Surah 5, verse 33. The punishment of those who wage war against Allah and his apostle and strive to make mischief in the land is only this, that they should be murdered or crucified, or their hands and their feet should be cut off on opposite sides, or they should be imprisoned. This shall be as a disgrace for them in this world, and in the hereafter they shall have a grievous chastisement. Notice that there are several penalties, including death, crucifixion, and dismemberment, for the vague crime of making mischief in the land. Since the crime is vague, Muslim groups like ISIS can pack all kinds of offenses into this verse. And yet, the U.S. State Department just put out a video making fun of ISIS for crucifying their enemies. When Muhammad was completely outnumbered, he had to put up with idolaters. But once he had the most powerful army in Arabia, the message of Islam became convert or die. Surah 9 verse 5 contains Allah's final marching orders on dealing with idolaters. When the sacred months have passed, slay the idolaters wherever you find them, and take them captive, and besiege them, and prepare for them each ambush. But if they repent, and establish worship, and pay the poor due, then leave their way free. Lo, Allah is forgiving, merciful. So kill them unless they convert to Islam. Sound familiar? Since idolaters have to convert or die, you might be wondering why ISIS gives Christians a third option, the option of paying jizya, tribute money. Surah 9, verse 29. Fight those who believe not in Allah, nor the last day, nor hold that forbidden which hath been forbidden by Allah and his messenger, nor acknowledge the religion of truth from among the people of the book, the people of the book are Jews and Christians, until they pay the jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. So the benefit of being a Jew or a Christian, according to Allah, is that you won't necessarily be slaughtered for refusing to convert. You have the option of paying tribute money to Muslims in acknowledgement of your inferiority. Is it just me, or is ISIS following the Quran to the letter? 
But ISIS doesn't just attack unbelievers. Muslims are also targeted. Why is that? Surah 9, verse 73. O prophet, strive hard against the unbelievers and the hypocrites and be unyielding to them. And their abode is hell and evil is the destination. The Arabic for strive hard here is a form of the word jihad. So Muslims are commanded to wage jihad not only against unbelievers, but also against hypocrites, people who claim to be Muslims but aren't doing what Allah tells them to do. The penalty for hypocrisy can vary depending on the severity of the hypocrisy, but when Muslims deviate from core Islamic doctrine, they find themselves in the apostate category, and the penalty for apostasy is death. So when ISIS kills Muslims who aren't adhering to central Muslim doctrines, they're just doing what Allah commands. But what about all the peaceful, westernized Muslims who condemn killing in the name of Allah? Sadly, Islam isn't defined by westernized Muslims. It's defined by Allah, who says in Surah 9, verse 111, Surely Allah has bought of the believers their persons and their property for this, that they shall have the garden. They fight in Allah's way, so they slay and are slain. Allah defines believers as those who slay and get slain. They keep killing until they get killed. Doesn't sound much like our peaceful Muslim neighbors, but it sounds an awful lot like ISIS. Muslims are only allowed to seek peace when they aren't in a position to violently subjugate their enemies. Allah says in Surah 47, verse 35, Be not weary and faint-hearted, crying for peace, when you should be uppermost, for Allah is with you and will never put you in loss for your good deeds. When the Muslim community is strong enough to slay the idolaters and to subjugate the Jews and Christians and to fight the hypocrites, peace is not an option. If you seek peace when you should be uppermost, you won't have much ground to stand on when ISIS knocks on your door and tells you that you're a hypocrite. This final verse might seem out of place because it's not about rape or slaughter, but you can't really understand how the verses about rape and slaughter fit into Islam as a whole without understanding Surah 2, verse 106. Whatever communications we abrogate or cause to be forgotten, we bring one better than it or like it. Do you not know that Allah has power over all things? People in the West have been trying to condemn the Islamic State by quoting peaceful verses of the Quran. How can you guys call yourselves Muslims when the Quran says there's no compulsion in religion? But those peaceful verses were revealed before Allah commanded his followers to slay idolaters and to subjugate Jews and Christians and to fight hypocrites. So the most important verse you need to know if you want to understand the Islamic State is Surah 2, verse 106, which lays out the doctrine of abrogation. Earlier verses get abrogated or canceled by later verses, which means that versions of Islam that oppose the sort of violence being committed by the Islamic State are now obsolete. Scholars disagree about this. The, the early scholars, and this is a debate in, within Islam, are these extremists really Muslims or not? I think the most correct a view is that they are Muslims, and this is what most of the Salaf, the early scholars, uh, held this view, that they were Muslims, but they were just rebellious, ignorant, innovative, uh, you know, had heretical beliefs. But he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that he would fight them even, showing us the permissibility to fight, the, fight these groups and to fight the Khawarij. That it is actually an obligation Islamically to fight them, fight them with an authority, not going out in the street, you hear, you hear someone with this ideology, you smack them. No, that's not what Islam calls you to. Islam is free from that type of violence and so forth. But for the Muslim authority, the Muslim groups, it is permissible for them to fight these groups and even have coalitions as we see today. And there's so much evidence from the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to illustrate this and from the Fuqaha of this Ummah and this is not the time and place to go into the depth of those matters but what we see today, these coalitions that are fighting extremism that those extremists would cut our necks just as quick as they would cut anyone else's necks of course we have to, we have to stamp out this evil and may Allah bless us with victory over them, I mean. I asked Sahal ibn Hunayf, did you hear the Prophet radiallahu ta'ala anhu, did you hear the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam saying anything about the Khawarij? 
He said, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, I heard him saying, while pointing his hand toward Iraq. Let's repeat that. He said, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, I heard him saying, meaning the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, while pointing his hand towards Iraq. Don't we see all this, a lot of these problems coming out of Iraq and Sham, wallahu musta'an. There will appear in it some people who will recite the Quran, but it will not go beyond their throats and they will go out from Islam as an arrow darts through the game's body. And we've witnessed this personally, I have been to Filah countless times. A lot of times you see people who are so extreme and of course extremism usually cannot sustain itself. Either extremists are killed or they break their methodology. They can't remain that way. You can't remain always being so extreme that usually that extremists, some of them, they usually leave Islam. One minute their supporters of Bin Laden and all this extremism, next minute they're not even Muslim anymore because their ideology they found to be, it, it broke, it couldn't support them. Their extremism itself couldn't be supported. And they see the falsehood of their ideology, so they go to the other extreme of either secularism or just leaving Islam totally. And uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, there would appear in it, meaning Iraq, some people who will recite the Quran, but it will not go beyond their throats, and they will go out from it, going go out from Islam as an arrow darts through the game's body. And because of this narration, some of the ulama say that the Khawarij, these extremists, are not even Muslim, that they are apostates from the religion of Islam. Some scholars say this. And they use this narration as evidence. So there's difference of opinion, but we know they're not in a good status. Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, I heard the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying, there would arise at the end of, uh, of the age a people who would be young in age. Look at these guys. A lot of these guys, this Abu Osama kid, he's a kid. He was trying to finish university. Look at these other guys. Teen from Brighton joins ISIS, is, is, is speculated as killed. Look in their videos. These are all young babies practically. They look like they're, some of these guys are in their teens. And some of them, they maybe get up to 40. They're young. Young, without experience, without knowledge, without much of anything. There would arise at the end of age a people would be young in age and immature in thought. This is, these are Islamic texts. This is what Islam tells us. These are what the Salaf of this Ummah, radiallahu ta'ala anu majma'in, this is what the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, our beloved Prophet. He told us they would be young in age, they would be immature in thought, but they would talk in such a manner as if their words are the best among the creatures. Charismatic. Charisma. They would recite the Quran, but it would not go beyond their throats. And they would pass through the deen as an arrow goes through the prey. So when you meet them, kill them. For in their killing, you would get a reward with Allah on the day of judgment. We have to fight those. We have to fight this wicked ideology. There's no way we can sit and allow this to, to, to taint the beautiful, pristine religion of Islam and taint the image of the Muslims any longer. The original Khwarij also ignored the Sunnah and thought world events were better interpreted by their understanding of the Quran. This is a characteristic of the original Khawarij. They didn't, they weren't known for adhering to the Sunnah because they claimed they made takfir of the companions of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, They said they didn't rule by the Sharia. Isn't this the same arguments that these people say, you don't rule by the Sharia. These ones don't rule by the Sharia. They're apostates. We fight them. It's our understanding. We read the ayat. Here's the verse. Here's how it applies. But they don't have any fiqh fiddin. The Prophet Muhammad said, Man khayran, Whenever Allah wants good for a person, He gives them understanding of the religion. Those people, Allah, it, 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 the evidence suggests that Allah does not want good for these people because they have no fiqh fi deen. They have no understanding of the religion. They abandon the sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, as this young kid said, I read the Quran and I read the newspaper and that was enough for me to go join ISIS. Where's the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Imam Baba Hari said, Al-Islam huwa sunnah wa sunnah to heal Islam. That Islam is a sunnah and the sunnah is Islam. And you can't have one without the other. This is Islam. It's a complete package. The beautiful manners, the beautiful characteristics, serving your parents, being kind to your neighbors, 
sharing Islam with people, not beheading people. That's not, that's not sharing Islam. Those aren't admirable characteristics. Cutting the necks of journalists, beheading a journalist. What is a journalist? What threat? If anything, it could have further your cause to show that you were merciful. Even non-Muslims would say, hey, those guys might have some points that are positive if they saw that you were exhibiting some Islamic characteristics. Free the journalist. Oh, we found a hiker. Free him. What's the point of killing them? What's the point of going into a mall, to a mall, blowing up school children, blowing up mothers, blowing up the elderly, blowing up this one, killing this one, shooting this one? What? What have you achieved? What have you achieved for Islam? Nothing. And so we see the original Khawarij, they ignored the Sunnah of the Prophet Wasallam, and they interpreted world events according to their interpretation. Likewise, these groups today, they interpret the Qur'an according to their understanding. And they take bits and pieces from classical scholars to try to support their methodology instead of taking all of Islam, all of the Nasus, and understanding what Islam has to offer. Isn't this the case with the young men and women who sacrifice for what they believe is Islam, but only fool themselves with brutality by being involved in themselves in takfir, and false jihads, and slaughtering, and oppressing others. And so we ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil and protect us from the evil of these groups and sects. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide these youth back to the pristine understanding of Islam and practice of Islam so that they can get right with their Lord and that they can set an example of goodness for the world to, to, to understand Islam and for many people to embrace Islam. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us with amal nafid, uskan tayyibu, amal al-muntaqabini. Anything I said that was correct was from Allah. Anything I said that was incorrect was from myself and the shaitan. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.